Hello, and welcome to this special webinar celebrating the 20th anniversary of Concord Law School at Purdue University Global, the nation's first fully online law school. I'm Marty Pritikin, the Dean of Concord, and we have with us a very distinguished guest, Martha Minow, who I'll introduce in more detail in just a moment. Now, Concord's mission since its founding two decades ago has been to make a high quality legal education accessible and affordable for those who cannot fit traditional law school in their lives or budgets due to family or work responsibilities, geography, military service, or other life circumstances. That's why it's particularly fitting for us to have as our special guest for this webinar, Martha Minow, to talk about the future of access to justice. So Professor Minow was nominated by uh, President Obama in 2010 to serve on the Legal Services Corporation and was confirmed by the Senate and then was voted by her fellow board members to be vice chair. She is the Carter Professor of General uh, Jurisprudence at Harvard University and Distinguished Service Professor at Harvard Law School. She served as Harvard Law School's most recent dean from 2009 to 2017. And in the interest of full disclosure, I should, should say that she was actually my professor when I was there, although for both of our sakes, I won't say how long ago that was. Um, she's also acting director of Harvard's Software Foundation Center on Ethics. Her honors include the Gold Medal for Outstanding Contribution to Public Discourse, the Sax Freund Teaching Award, the Holocaust Center Award, and honorary doctorates from Northwestern University and a half a dozen other institutions of higher education. She serves or has served on the boards of the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the American Bar Foundation, the W.T. Grant Foundation, the International Independent Commission on Kosovo, and the Iranian, Iranian Human Rights Documentation Center, among many others. She received her BA from University of Michigan, her master's in education from Harvard, and her JD from Yale. And she began her legal career as a law clerk to Judge David Bazelon of the United States Circuit Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia and to Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall. I could go on with her accolades, but if I did, we wouldn't actually have time to talk about access to justice. Um, so let's get to it. Uh, before we do, just a reminder to those of you who are watching via Facebook Live, you can submit questions via the comment box, and we will do our best to weave those into the discussion, time permitting. So Martha, really, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. We really, really appreciate it. Marty, it's a pleasure, and it's also a pleasure to see you as a dean. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you know, I've got a, a great role model to look up to. Um, why don't we start out, you know, before we get to the future of access to justice, for those in the audience who might not all be equally familiar with what is access to justice or what is the crisis in access to justice that we talk about so much in this country, can you give a little context and background to what the problem is and what the scope of the problem is? You know, our Constitution actually includes justice right there in the uh, purpose, uh, and so does the Pledge of Allegiance. And yet the actual realization of the ideal of justice uh, remains out of reach. And why is that? Well, just starting with the possibility of people having access to a lawyer to help them navigate uh, legal problems in their lives. Not very many people can afford a lawyer. And currently the poverty level in the United States is such that about 16% of all Americans fall below the poverty level or 125% of the poverty level, which is the, the level uh, specified by the federal government for eligibility for public resources for access to justice. And yet there are just so many more people who fall in that category than the actual resources permit. The moment 31% of children in America fall in this category. Access to justice is sometimes called the justice gap. Sometimes it's called the problem of unequal justice. Look at the, uh, the words carved at the top of the Supreme Court, equal justice for all. So if you start with court access, if you in, in places like the United uh, like Massachusetts, 90% of those people coming to housing court do not have a lawyer. Uh, who, are the, who are tenants, whereas 90% of those who are landlords do have a lawyer. That's mm -hmm. unequal justice. Of course, many justice issues are not just those that arise in court. There are many issues that really people have in their lives that could help uh, navigating the legal system with or without a lawyer, whether it's seeking veterans benefits or dealing with a special education issue for a child 
or actually just simply navigating the healthcare system and health insurance. Uh, many people don't even put law uh, in their self-understanding of what the problem is. They just say, I have a health problem or I have an education problem with my child. And yet there are legal frameworks that govern all of that. I, I think that one of the very sobering uh, experiences that many people had in this country comes uh, with natural disasters. We have many more natural disasters uh, increasingly, it seems, you know, because of hurricanes and fires and other kinds of really terrible uh, phenomenon outside of human control, well, that often leads people with problems with their housing, lacking their documents to be able to demonstrate their rights, um, just trying to keep their affairs in order. And again, uh, being able to have some assistance during those times would really make a difference. And yet we have a crisis because most people can't afford it. You know, that's a great point, um, and obviously very timely given what just happened with Hurricane Michael down in the Florida Panhandle. I was listening to a story this morning talking about how it was the east side of the city that got hit particularly hard, which was the generally poorer side of the city, and how they weren't getting early access to disaster relief. Um, of course, their homes are destroyed if they even have insurance or yes. having a harder time navigating, dealing with their insurance companies. Uh, you know, right, it's the type of thing people don't always think of when they think of a justice gap. But it's obviously very real and very important for the people, you know, in those situations. Well, it's been about 10 years since the Katrina disaster. And there are still people who are digging out legally the consequences right. because records were lost. And also because the way that property is distributed there is true in Puerto Rico, too. It's often in a family and there aren't uh, the documents, title and so forth. So to be able to demonstrate and to reclaim insurance, very, very challenging. Right, right. And, you know, people sometimes say, well, I don't understand. How could there be an access to justice problem? Because don't defendants have a right to an attorney, right? That's the Miranda warning we all hear about. But what a lot of people don't realize is that's only for criminal cases. No, right? exactly most, right. Most think, legal problems people have are not criminal problems. There is no right to an attorney in any civil matter, no matter how poor you are, no matter how high the stakes. You're absolutely right. And I think it's not, not their fault, but most people who have not gone to law school don't know the difference between a civil matter and a criminal matter and don't know the names of categories like a tort violation or even a contract or consumer protection violation. And right. yet, yes, you're right. The right to counsel as articulated by the United States Supreme Court is only in criminal matters and only those where there's a jeopardy of loss of personal liberty. Uh, and, you know, there are problems there, too. Uh, the public defender's services are not as funded as they ought to be, but at least there's a right to counsel. Right. Interestingly, there are, there's a movement for right to counsel on the civil side, and there are experiments with it. So in New York right now, uh, in the housing court, there's a right to counsel. Um, and what's so dramatic is people who have a lawyer are much, much more likely to stay in their homes than people who do not. Right. And they found similar things. They did a study, I'm not sure if it was California, New York, about family court, right? Because family court has similar rates of self-represented litigants. And they found that those who were represented had measurably better outcomes than those who didn't. It's absolutely true. And again, it's very problematic if one side has a lawyer and the other side does not. Right. Um, right. Because the, then that really is inequality staring you in the face. Uh, I think that there are other issues that fall in the realm of access to justice that many people don't know. So the asthma epidemic in this country turns out to be often related to housing conditions mm. and violations of housing codes. And it turns out that there are medical legal partnerships that uh, actually in intake in the hospital uh, they, they now ask people questions about the nature of their housing. and try to provide people some kind of access to legal representation, which turns out to reduce the, the use of emergency rooms for asthma-related harms. I mean, that's an example people might not have thought of as yeah, a I never thought problem, about. but uh, it turns out law can make a difference. Wow. You know, another aspect of access to justice that people may not always think about is geography, right? Because I know, especially with our school, which is a fully online school, we sometimes have students come to our school because the nearest brick and mortar law school might be four or five hours away. Um, and they simply, you know, they can't pick up their lives and move and they certainly aren't going to do that commute. 
we've had graduates where they're the only lawyer in their county or there is you know one lawyer in the county um and that's the that's a huge issue too even if people can afford a lawyer if they can't actually get access to one for whatever reason um that's also a problem well it's it, you're absolutely right and you know all over this country we have many different kinds of divisions but the one that i am thinking about a lot these days is urban and rural and so if you live outside of a city and outside of the suburbs that surround the city the likelihood that you are within reach of a lawyer is much much less than if you're in a city and so right. even organizations that that try to provide legal services a full time or pro bono public service by lawyers if there isn't a lawyer in the region it's very hard uh to make that available yeah and i know working with various legal services organizations a lot of them are in metropolitan areas it's true. that's where lawyers are that's where there's a you know tight concentration of clients it's much harder in the rural areas well they tend to try to be close to where the court houses are right right so um, let me ask you for a few minutes about Legal Services Corporation. So you're the vice chair. Um, I think a lot of people may not have heard of the Legal Services Corporation, or when they hear the name, they assume it's some sort of for-profit company that provides legal services. What is LSC and, and what does it do? So the Legal Services Corporation grew out of the war on poverty. It is 100% funded by the federal government, and it is an organization that funds in turn 133 local independent legal services providers around the country. Those local legal services providers often get money from other sources, for example, from private attorneys or from the state or from United Way or other kinds of philanthropy. But many are reliant, uh, more than 50%, on the public federal dollars. Now, what do those organizations do? They provide uh, services to people in family law, uh, in housing, as we've been discussing, in consumer protection, access to benefits for veterans and people who with disabilities. And those organizations couldn't do it if they didn't have the federal funding. The national organization on whose board I serve not only dispenses that funding, but also provides technical assistance to try to pr improve the work of the grantees. And one of the developments in the last uh, five, six years has been to try to promote the use of technology. Technologies to uh, facilitate um, the ability of, uh, of potential clients to access the services, technology to actually even automate some of the services, and technology, as we were just discussing, uh, to help reach people who may not be able physically to get to the office. So technology grants is one of the activities that the Legal Services Corporation participates in. And another activity is to highlight uh, issues like natural disasters. I currently co-chair a task force for the Legal Services Corporation on natural disasters and trying to integrate legal needs with the other kinds of needs that people have. We have another task force right now that's addressing the consequences of the opioid crisis for communities. And in the past, uh, I co-chaired a task force on pro bono services to try to better integrate pro bono offerings by practicing lawyers with the needs of communities. One more activity of the Legal Services Corporation is to try to educate uh, the public and indeed even the members of Congress about the issues uh, that face us. Perhaps many people don't know this, it's a bipartisan organization. So there's a board, uh, you mentioned that I was nominated, the board by statute has to have half of the members from one party, from the party of the president, and half of the members from uh, the other party. Um, and that really stems again from its history. So the president who signed the authorizing legislation was Richard Nixon. And Richard Nixon was a lawyer. He actually said very positive things about the role of lawyers for poor people. People may not remember that Richard Nixon actually also supported a negative income tax. He was concerned about the needs of people in poverty. But there were plenty of uh, controversies uh, during his time and later. Uh, other presidents were not so supportive. 
So the entity has designed as an independent nonprofit organization. So it's kind of a camel, you know, a horse uh, designed by a committee is a camel. So it's it's a public but nonprofit created by Congress, board appointed by the president, Senate approval, uh, funded by the federal government with an inspector general uh, who's also funded by the uh, federal government and subject to the Open Meetings Act. And yet it's a nonprofit private organization. It is a very interesting and, and unique entity. Um, I was actually reading a little bit about the history of it, and I learned that President Nixon signed it into law on July 24th, I believe, 15 days before he resigned. I'm not saying there's a connection, but um, it's interesting. I mean, even in the last days, we're very fortunate that he made sure to, to do this before he stepped down. Um, you know, who knows what would have gotten passed with subsequent administrations. Well, one of the reasons it took a long time from its initial idea to its actual creation was that Nixon himself wanted the president to have the power to appoint the board. And there was a struggle over that. And that's one of the reasons it has the current structure that it does. Interesting. President mm -hmm. Trump has not been a huge fan of the Legal Services Corporation. And indeed, he has proposed eliminating it. He's not the first president to propose eliminating it, but that has been on his agenda. And in his most recent budget, he proposed that there be just a little bit of money to uh, pay for closing it down. However, there was a reaction uh, across the country that really uh, was very heartwarming to me. Um, over 200 general counsel from large corporations signed a letter saying they uh, wanted to support the Legal Services Corporation, wanted the federal government to support it. Similarly, uh, the, the Conference of Chief Justices from the state courts um, uh, put in a statement to that effect, as did um, over half of the attorneys general of the United States. And actually, rather than shutting it down, the current budget that President Trump signed increased the budget by $25 million per year. Well, that's wonderful. I'm very glad to hear that. Um, we actually have an uh, audience question that holds sort of on point. In terms of the, the scope of the mandate of LSC, um, there's a question about whether it deals with wrongful convictions. Does LSC deal with anything criminal or are they only focus on the civil side? LSC only focuses on the civil side, except in the limited instance of Indian reservations, where there is a grantee that receives funding and there's a limited statutory basis for criminal matters there. But public defenders, of course, deal with wrongful convictions. I will say that there are collateral consequences of criminal conviction that have a civil dimension and legal services organizations can help with that. So for example, being foreclosed from getting a driver's license or um, a barber's license or other collateral consequences, losing child custody or other family matters. Um, those are very much across the central mission of the Legal Services Corporation. Right, and interesting too, right? Because those collateral consequences are, are a big issue, the right to vote amongst other things. Um, because those collateral consequences are not criminal matters, Again, there's no right to, to counsel in those areas. Quite there, right, quite right. Though so California, I think, has been more um, uh, thoughtful about this than many other places, and some of the cities have come up with actual projects to help people address the collateral consequences. Right. And this is an issue, though, in many, many parts of the country. You know, it's interesting. You mentioned Indian reservations. So when I joined Concord a few years ago, I was very interested in doing outreach to Indian reservations because I thought, well, here's an area where you know, there's a real need for online legal education. There's a need for lawyers. And if they don't have to leave the reservation to get that education, that obviously benefits them as well as those they serve. One of the biggest initial challenges I found was that in a lot of Indian reservations, they don't even have the reliable access to an internet connection or computers to even take an online legal education. So when you mentioned technology grants, I wondered if that was something that LSC or other entities are, are focusing on with regard to reservations. Uh, we actually have had some technology innovation grants that work with some Indian reservations, but we don't have the ability to fund the creation of reliable internet service. Uh, right. That will require infrastructure resources outside our scope. Right, right. 
So uh, assuming the funding continues and assuming the entity continues, where do you see LSC going? Do you see any changes in its priorities or particular challenges or opportunities? Well, the allocation of the money is largely prescribed by Congress and 93% of the money actually goes directly to the grantee organizations by a formula that's set by the poverty populations in the receiving states. The, there is a, a, a line item that is the technology innovation grants, and I, I've been fascinated to see that even during tough financial times, Congress has doubled that amount. Um, and so I predict we'll have more work along the technology innovation front. Uh, one of the terrific initiatives really spearheaded by our chair, John Levy, who is a partner of the law firm Sidley Austin, uh, he he helped to navigate a partnership with Microsoft. And Microsoft has donated a million dollars and in-kind services to develop two pilot websites for states that are a kind of portal for legal services in, uh, in those two states. And with a competition among states wanting to receive that help, Alaska is one and Hawaii is the other. And I think we're gonna see more and more of that kind of a resource where there's a one-stop shopping, if you will, uh, that in a given state, uh, an individual can go online and find where do I go for uh, a, a custody problem with my child or for a housing problem. And it might be uh, an organization funded by our legal services uh, corporation, but it might be other organizations. And there might even also be links to online forms or to software that help people uh, have an interactive uh, interview and answer questions and then produce the forms and submit them. Um, I think we're going to see more and more of that nature, and I think it's a good thing. Now, why can't we just do one website for the whole country? And it's, as you know very, very well, every state has different laws right. on each one of these subjects. And so we have to develop uh, materials that are responsive to each state. Indeed, sometimes within the state, there are different rules. So until recently, Texas had different court rules for each, each uh, county. Uh, which made it problematic to give legal advice in the state. Right, and right. Trying to coordinate, and that's helpful. You know, it's interesting. I'm obviously very interested in the technology side of things and, and the ability to bring down costs and, and increase access through technology. Um, there's a site that I believe, if I remember, is launching today, um, although I hope by mentioning it, I don't crash the site. Um, I don't know if you've heard of it. It's called Pro Bono, Pro Bo K-N-O-W. Um, and it was started in Orange County. California, I believe they were part of UCI's uh, incubator program. And um, they essentially are looking to be, uh, I'm going to call it a marketplace, but really a site where clients who are looking for free legal services can uh, sign on. And then lawyers who are willing to provide those services can, can try and match them up. It also tries to match up more senior lawyers who are willing to serve as mentors for those newer lawyers right, to help make sure they understand how to run the cases. Um, and their aspiration uh, ultimately is to scale and, and become national, uh, with the hope being is that if they can link up the clients and lawyers, then if they're not providing the actual substantive legal advice, hopefully they can go cross-jurisdictional. Um, so I have heard of that, that. And, and there actually are some other experiments like that. So the Emerson Collective has funded one that particularly focuses on retired attorneys. And, you know, it's kind of an Uber model for right. law, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, right. I think if it can be integrated with the kind of legal advice where people may be able to represent themselves and not even need a lawyer, then we could right. really see an enormous change. So I think that's exciting. Another site that's uh, being launched this week actually allows people with a small claim uh, to uh, actually click a button, file their complaint, and have it go directly to a small claims court. Now, small really? claims court were, were launched after Roscoe Pound in 1909. Uh, gave a speech about the dissatisfactions with ordinary justice. And small claims courts were supposed to be easily used by people without lawyers. It's turned out though, it's the primary user 
uh, are debt collectors and they tend to have legal representation and it's the consumers who do not have legal representation. So I'm interested to see the introduction of technology here. So let's talk a little more about technology. I mean, that's obviously where I see uh, the, the future of things going. Um, are there particular technologies, whether it's you know video conferencing or other more sophisticated technologies that you think are going to be a, a, a big factor in addressing access to justice? Well, I do think that there are some very promising developments, both in the category of document production and in the category of artificial intelligence. So document production, uh, you know, for administrative agencies, uh, for courts, um, very often a barrier for people is that they actually don't understand the forms or some courts are actually pretty persnickety and reject a submission if it's not, doesn't have the spacing right or the formulations exactly correct. So there are these uh, several uh, different kinds of document production software, where, which basically take information that a, a, a someone with a legal need answers through an interview and then produces the right kind of documents. I think that th that's very, very promising. Um, and you know, you could go one step further the way that eBay has, has gone. eBay now resolves millions of disputes every year without the intervention of a human being. And that's the beginning of the artificial intelligence part. I've heard that that's actually that platform resolves more disputes than any human entity already. It, it is true, and, and with high levels of reported satisfaction. Now, eBay is only dealing with monetary disputes. It, right. I think it would be more difficult to deal with child custody or criminal justice. But I, again, think there's a lot of promise here. And then even going further, you know, I do think that there are um, tools that are in the works or already exist. For example, um, it, big issue in employment law right now is whether a particular job should be characterized as an uh, independent contractor or an employee. And different jurisdictions have different rules about that. It's very hard to figure that out. The rules are changing as well. Um, and uh, there is software that some law firms have developed that can give the answer un under any jurisdiction, given the description of the job, which, which, what is it? Well, how will it be classified? You know, okay. that's the kind of question that might have taken someone in a law firm a week to research. And now, you, you know, you can subscribe to a service and get that answer. I wish there were more such uh, tools that were publicly available you didn't have to pay for. Um, and I think that we then have um, the real, real possibility of closing this gap, access to justice. At the same time, let's be clear, there are issues with the use of technology. Uh, so for example, many courts are now using uh, an algorithmic tool to decide who should get parole or who should get probation. Right. And this might be great, but the, the typical uh, approach is to use software that is, first of all, proprietary, so no one outside can check and see whether it's reliable. And secondly, to feed the algorithm through machine learning prior data. Well, the prior data coming from courts may itself be very problematic, may reflect racial biases, for example, from the judges. So the algorithms could get very smart and replicate or even exacerbate patterns that we don't want. So we have to actually watch very carefully these developments in technology um, and explore the ethical dimensions. And uh, in a democratic society, the accountability, uh, transparency. But with that said, I think um, th there's a lot to learn and a lot to be hopeful about. I want to transition a bit to talk about what's sometimes referred to as low bonus services, right? So this is people who, they don't necessarily qualify for free legal services, even assuming that there was enough resources to serve all those people, which there clearly is not, right? But, you know, regular middle class, working class folks who, they don't qualify for free legal services, but they cannot possibly afford the $250, $300 an hour and up, which are the prevailing rates for lawyers in, in many markets. Um, the idea of Lobono is offering not free legal services, but discounted legal services to modest means clients. Um, 
Now, LSC, I assume, doesn't really have a focus on low bono per se. Is that right? Well, that's correct. Um, although the Legal Services Corporation allows cooperative relationships between our grantees and private attorneys. And many of those private attorneys uh, themselves offer a mix, low bono, pro bono, full, full pay, and then contract services. So we're very interested in this and very interested in different modes of compensating uh, attorneys and legal services. I'd also add, you know, perhaps the most explosive question uh, in this area is why does it have to be a licensed attorney who's providing the services? Uh, And certainly in large law firms, they have teams of people, paralegals and allied legal professionals some engineers and others providing services, and depending on the field, if it's immigration or family law, having social workers or people with other training can also be very helpful. So I think uh, low bono uh, could actually be one of the uh, avenues that helps us build connections with non-lawyers and others who can provide legal services. I think that... Um, One of the topics that has historically been neglected uh, in law and in law schools is the actual economics of legal services and how to run a law practice and how to make ends meet. And I'm very interested in incubators that are helping people put together, you know, the paying clients and the non-paying clients and the uh, contingency fee cases and the ones that actually um, have a retainer. Um, and understanding that it is a business and uh, it, one can make a good living even while doing good, but it takes some thought and some practice to, to work that out. You know, in family law, which is a field I've worked in uh, historically, there are paying clients, many who have a lot of money. And then there are a lot of clients who don't have much at all. And if you can provide a practice that mixes uh, those different kinds of clients, you can make a, a, a perfectly good living. Um, I do think that there are, though, many, many matters where we shouldn't have to have a lawyer. We shouldn't have to have a lawyer. We should develop the ways to resolve the matter without a lawyer or certainly much more cheaply. And uh, there should be pressure on the system to do so. So it raises a few interesting things I want to follow up on. So one is in terms of actually having lawyers, um, you know, limited scope representation right, or unbundled legal services. This, for those who aren't familiar, is the idea that, you know, the traditional model of representation is, I take your case, I either charge you a flat fee or an hourly rate, and I take it from start to finish. The idea is not everyone can afford that, and not everyone necessarily wants or needs that, right? Because if it costs me $20,000 to handle your civil matter, and you've only got 3000 maybe I say, well, okay, I'll draft the initial demand letter and I'll help advise you about that initial court appearance or get you past that first hearing. And then if after that, if you want more representation, we'll renegotiate it, you know, another uh, representation. So the idea is, you know, people can at least get partial representation for whatever it is they really need or whatever it is they can afford, which in many instances is better than nothing at all, even though it may not be as, as good as full blown representation. But some of the limitations on this are actually regulatory, right? Yes. Because many jurisdictions, the status of limited scope representation is uncertain as to how permissible it is or, or what the what the parameters are. Um, do you know if there have been any movements to try and get any uniformity on, on that issue or at least more buy-in from jurisdictions on that issue? I do know that there are uh, judges on state courts that are talking about it. The American Bar Association has talked about it. You know, it's difficult because there are political uh, alliances and divisions about it. Um, But I do think um, there's an emergence of new thinking, that it's not all or nothing. And oftentimes, one of the most interesting parts of unbundled legal services, in my view, is that it leads to this educational dimension that a lawyer can educate a client about probabilities of succeeding with a particular avenue or not, and even about what's the most critical or pivotal step, uh, either in litigation or in a transaction, and, uh, and, and agree mutually about what, therefore, the lawyer should do as opposed to what the client can do. 
Um, in many areas, uh, actually equipping a, 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 an individual to do self-representation, uh, whether it's to go into court or it's to uh, write a will or other kinds of documents, um, the lawyer doesn't have to do it all. The lawyer can help identify the key questions. Problem is historically, and I understand this, uh, legal ethics have said, you take on a client, you take on a client, you take on all of the client's uh, related issues, and it's malpractice if you don't pursue it all the way. And what we have to do is develop some notion of standards and professional responsibility and uh, code features that can be compatible with more limited representation. Now I want to follow up on the other angle, which is non-lawyers. Um, so, you know, Washington State has implemented the limited legal license technology. I, it's LLLT. I forget which one the L stands for. Um, but they allow them in very... Uh, Only family laws. Yes. What? Only family law. Only family law. Right, right, right. And California, Utah, and I think one other jurisdiction are at least considering it. We don't know if they'll, they'll go there. Um, do you think that's going to be an important area in the future? You know, sort of they're, they're not a paralegal, they're not a lawyer. Um, do you think the LLLT or that model is going to become more prevalent? I don't know about that particular model. I think the state of Washington has found that the cost involved uh, does not translate into uh, jobs for most of the graduates that are sustainable. And that's partly because the negotiated outcome with opposition to the very idea from some sectors of the bar uh, produced a requirement of two years, two years of legal education. That's pretty expensive and pretty uh, uh, prohibitive for a lot of people. But I'd compare that with the court navigators development in New York. So New York has developed uh, a, a role for people who help individuals just walk through the court process. And these navigators get training that's just a few weeks. And that's not as prohibitive, and it's even a tree training. So I think somewhere in that range, we're going to see the explosion of what I guess I would like to call allied legal professionals, the same way that the medical profession has developed many, many different kinds of roles uh, that are way beyond uh, everybody having to get a medical degree. There are different kinds of nurses. There are different levels of nursing, and there are many medical technology experts, and right. it's appropriate. And right. it's, in my mind, one of the many areas where the legal profession and law in general can learn from medicine. So here's another point of comparison. In the year 1900, the likelihood that if you or I were alive and we ended up in a hospital, likelihood that we'd live was less than 50%. Now, that's not true now. What has changed? The biggest thing that changed was the introduction of evidence-based medicine, using research and data to actually study the effect of one or another kind of uh, uh, intervention. We don't do that in law very much. We don't study what happens to somebody who goes to housing court and gets a in order to have an improvement of the facilities. What happens to someone who has joint custody as opposed to sole custody? We don't do enough studies. And if we did, I think there's a good chance we could improve the quality of justice. That's a great point. Speaking of analogies to the uh, medical profession, um, so obviously it hasn't taken off nearly as much as uh, medical insurance, health insurance has, but some companies offer their employees legal insurance, right? Or there's yes. some networks of lawyers where you're not just hanging out a shingle, right? But you're part of this insurance network. You're sort of a, a staff attorney for this network. Do you see that as a way to try and address the economics of law practice? Well, I think it's really interesting. Uh, and some unions have done this and provided uh, insurance coverage. And there are some employers who also provide uh, access to the legal services for members of their, uh, their team and find that it actually reduces, for example, absenteeism, uh, helps people uh, stay in their homes, helps people deal with family matters. So this, again, the analogy to medicine, those uh, employers that provide um, health 
coverage have found that to be a benefit over time. I think we might well, but I think that there's a lot of house cleaning to be done on the part of the legal system to make it uh, financially remunerative and efficient to provide that kind of coverage. So um, I want to transition to talk about uh, legal education and how that plays into access sure. to justice. Obviously, you've been a longtime professor and administrator of one of the nation's most well-known and prestigious law schools. Um, so I'm uh, very excited to talk to you about this topic. Um, how do you see law schools fulfilling a role of addressing the justice gap in terms of what they have been doing, what they are doing, and, and what you think they should or could be doing if they aren't? It's such a critical question, and I know that you have been doing some very innovative and important work in this area, so I hope we can make this a conversation. You know, I think that law schools uh, have, of course, as their central mission, education about law and developing the next generation of lawyers. So at a minimum, I would hope every law school is teaching uh, its students about the access to justice problem and about the possible roles that people can play, whether they're in uh, corporate practice or they are doing part-time law and part-time business. Uh, anybody who is a lawyer can provide pro bono legal services and be part of initiatives so that if they're daunted by the possibility, oh no, I'm gonna to have to represent this client forever, they can be part of a team and not have to feel that burden. They can also learn how to do it in conjunction with a legal services organization. They can help train people how to do a housing case, how to represent someone who's facing domestic violence, for example. But in addition, I think uh, clinics have been a very important part of legal education. Uh, and and it's always uh, been true that it's a practical education, but really not until the, the last 30 years have many law schools developed uh, either relationships with uh, providers of legal services where students can do internships or their own in-house clinics. Uh, and not only is this a way to actually meet some legal needs in the community, it's also a way to train people who can then carry on uh, those kinds of services once they graduate, as well as a sense of public service. Um, I also am fascinated by the development of clinics that are innovative. So clinics that are, for example, using technology or trying to develop uh, new kinds of ways to reduce the access to justice gap. One of our clinics, for example, has a partnership with the Massachusetts courts to come up with software to try to facilitate uh, uh, people without lawyers navigating the court system. Right, um, well, there's a well -on one. Yes, that's a great example. And you know, one other uh, feature that I think more law schools could do is I've been very interested to see that in different communities, uh, different configurations of people and institutions can come together to meet the access to justice problem. And in some communities, it might be a bar association that's at the core and they integrate lawyers uh, and companies and others. And some it's law schools. Some it's the law school that is the meeting place uh, that trains people and comes up with a, an electronic platform that allows people to work together and collaborate together. In some places, it may be a library uh, where librarians are the ones who are uh, navigating and helping people connect. But I think law schools have a genuine role to play here. Yeah, I, this is something that I obviously feel strongly about. Um, Concord, we actually launched our incubator program last year in partnership with the Lady Society of Orange County. So it's the first online law school uh, incubator program. And what's interesting is, so we're working with the Lady Society of Orange County, who also works with the local brick and mortar schools in Orange County, right. but for our participants, half of them are in California, none of them are actually in Orange County, um, and then half are in different places around the country, right. ones in like Hawaii, uh, rural Ohio, North Carolina, Texas. Um, so we're helping them figure out how to provide that remote mentoring, right, as well as linking up the incubator participants with the local Southern California clients remotely. Um, so that's been uh, an interesting uh, exercise for us. Um, one of the things that I feel strongly about uh, is cost of legal education. And the reason I say this is my former school, uh, they were traditional brick and mortar school. They had an incubator program. I helped launch it. 
And I had graduates who said, you know, Professor Pritikin, sounds like a great program, but I've got $200,000 in debt. I can't afford to hang out a shingle and represent the little guy. Um, and then when I came across an online law school, which was one third of the cost, I said, hey, people can graduate with much less debt and, you know, have more options in terms of who they represent. Um, so, you know, I'm curious because you have the Harvard law schools of the world, which are very expensive, right? But your typical Harvard law grad could get a job where they could service that debt if that's what they want to do. But then you have some of the less highly ranked law schools that cost almost exactly the same. Um, and yet their graduates may not have the same prospects of passing the bar, of getting uh, a high paying job. And so I'm curious if you have any thoughts about how the economics of law school plays into this, uh, because for decades, if not a century, we've had a model where you've got basically 200 law schools and they're all providing, and it not, I don't want to say all, there are some notable exceptions, um, but many of them are providing a path for their students to try and get jobs at the so-called white shoe law firms, when even before the Great Recession, only about 25% of law grads got those jobs. It's always been the case that most law grads have gone into solo practice or small firms, government work, business. Do you see that changing? Do you, I'm curious what you think about that. Well, it's such a, a powerful point of view. You know, I do uh, think that the recession of 2008, 2009 was a wake-up call for the legal profession. And while hiring at the big firms is back on track, the their clients in the meantime have become much more skeptical about the bills. And one of the interesting developments is the rise of middle-sized firms that can offer the same services for much less money. Right. Um, so I think we're going, we're going to be living through a period of change in how legal services, even at the most expensive level, are provided. So all the more so for small businesses uh, and for individuals who need lawyers. Um, we are seeing an explosion of new kinds of uh, hybrid services, mixture of online and in person. Um, and uh, there, the ABA itself has piloted a legal answers website uh, that crowdsources with lawyers answers to questions. Um, I think we're gonna see a lot of experimentation. What does it mean for the financing of legal education? Well, first I can say that um, Loan forgiveness is a long-standing tool to try to enable individuals from any kind of law school to pursue their uh, preference, if they have it, to serve low-income people or do public interest work. Not every school can afford to forgive loans. Um, but for the Legal Services Cor Corporation, for example, uh, is itself part of a very specified loan forgiveness program. So lawyers who work for the Legal Services Corporation funded entities can have their loans forgiven, very similar to the way that there's public financing for medical education for people who serve in underserved areas. Right. That particular program is in jeopardy right now in Congress. I think it's an important program as I do think that loan forgiveness programs guaranteed by the federal government in general are just good investments. The challenge for altering the fee structure for most law schools uh, is that actually it's expensive to pay for people. It's uh, the biggest part of any budget is the staff. It's the faculty, as you know. Um, and the buildings are expensive and the library is expensive, but nowhere is expensive as the people. And those are ongoing expenses. So one of the challenges and opportunities that I, I am seeing and I predict will become more so is more collaboration. More collaboration among existing law schools, more collaborations between law schools and other sources of legal expertise. Um, and there might well be more experimentation about the three-year requirement. So far, those experiments have not worked. Northwestern, for example, tried a two-year program that they've now uh, set aside. But we see Arizona now developing a joint BA law degree program. I think we're gonna see more and more experimentation of that nature. And in addition, if at the same time that we have the possibility of allied legal professionals, 
developing. I think that there will be varieties of providers uh, of legal services, education, and legal services themselves, and that'll open up some opportunities to reduce the cost of legal education. I, I agree with a lot of that. Um, I also think along the lines of what you were saying, it is important that law schools educate their students about the economics of being a lawyer and about the dynamics in the legal profession. Um, we actually have a, a required course for our students called the Future of Law Practice. They take it right. in the third year um, where they learn about the, not only the economic, but the technological and, and you know, societal changes that are impacting the legal profession. Uh, we actually make all of our students develop and orally present on a business plan, whether they plan right. to open up their own practice or just sort of understand how the economics of law practice, whether it's in-house for a corporation or, or whatever the case may be, um, I, I think that's really important. Um, I mean, I know as, as much as I love my education at Harvard, uh, we didn't talk about the economics of, of being a lawyer, the economics of, you know, getting a lawyer. Um, that's and- changed. So we now have my colleague, David Wilkins, uh, runs our Center on the Legal Profession and teaches a very popular course on exactly those subjects, but it's a change, it's a change. And it's interesting then to put this all in a global perspective, because so far we've been talking only about the United States, but there is dramatic experimentation, as you know, going on in England, in Australia, many other countries to try to figure out, they also have access to justice problems. Although ours is notably very problematic, you know, on a world uh, rating of access to justice, we don't do very well. Um, But still, we have a lot to learn from what other countries are doing. And and other countries are experimenting with different forms of legal education and different forms of providing legal services. So I think it's an exciting time to be thinking about this. I agree. And I think that uh, technology necessarily has to play a role because... There's just, we don't have the resources or the manpower to scale up and address the problem in the way that we've been providing representation historically. I mean, you know, you talked about 16% of the population. That's almost 60 million people. Right. In perspective. And there's another 60 million people who would fall into what many would say, or is that low bono category? So you're talking 120 million people who don't have the access they need to affordable uh, representation. I mean, it's just, it's, it's mind boggling. You, you need technology to, to, to tackle that. Well, and we, we coming at it from the other side need to improve the systems that people need to work th- through their legal problems. So mm-hmm. I think as more and more people now are experienced with shopping online, they're kind of shocked that there's not a comparably easily navigated site to deal with their legal issues. Right. And I think there's going to be a demand appropriately that legal institutions change and, and uh, become much more user-friendly and not use opaque language and complex uh, processes. You know, I'm very struck by, again, I come back to veterans assistance, people who serve this country, people who have rights to benefits shouldn't have to face an obstacle when they're trying to access those benefits. We should make it as easy to access as possible. Makes you wonder whether the people who design the bureaucracy don't want the veterans to get the benefits. So there's an example where I think there's some important innovations happening. One of our grantees, uh, the Pine Tree Legal Assistance in Maine has developed some technologies, particularly to help not just veterans, but also their family members deal with their legal issues uh, that they have. And Stateside is the name of the portal of the website there. And I think that that, that's just the beginning of a sign that we could change the legal system itself to be much more user friendly. Uh, There's a law firm I know, uh, Aiken Aiken Gup, that has developed a free um, service for people who want to be entrepreneurs to incorporate their business. And of course, they hope that it will be an entree for people coming from other services. But I think that's a wonderful development. And I hope we see much more competition along those lines. Yeah, that's great. Well, you know, it's interesting. So um, I'm seeing what some of the questions are that people are posting. And a lot of them have to do with uh, questions about, is there a particular entity uh, that will help with certain types of legal problems, whether it's child custody or civil commitment or special education? Um, I know it probably is going to be largely a jurisdiction specific uh, thing, but 
I was wondering, are there any primary sites people should go to that can at least refer them to other sites, sort of looking for a list of legal service providers or uh, you know, other resources? Well, until recently, really all there was was the local bar, and the local bar is still a good place to go. Uh, because law is so much uh, contingent on the states, I do think people should first go to their own state and see if there is uh, a website uh, that collects all the resources in their state. The American Bar Association has a pro bono site as well. Um, and as even if it's not pro bono, um, I do think that librarians increasingly are able to put people in touch with resources. Um, I know that many law schools uh, provide a kind of reference and referral service also in their areas. And it tends not to be organized by these subject matters. It's really by locale. Right, right. Coming at it from the other angle, so, um, and this was actually something people asked, but I was going to touch on anyway. So if people want to get involved, they want to actually help. Obviously, lawyers can provide pro bono services. Um, and if they are in a metropolitan area, in all likelihood, there is a legal services provider, a legal aid, or they can contact their local bar association. What are other things people can do? You know, I don't know how many of the people who are watching this right now are lawyers, are law students, are prospective law students, how many aren't involved in the legal field at all, or, or even what jurisdictions they're in. Um, if people want to get involved, whether it's grassroots or advocacy to try and help promote resources for legal services, what are the types of things people can do? I do think that, uh, as you've mentioned, the bar associations are a good place. I also, also think law schools. Uh, many law schools actually um, are themselves developing projects to connect practicing lawyers with law students to provide legal services. Um, in addition, the courts, the state courts, all of them, um, have programs that are, try to make their resources more accessible. And many are looking for volunteers, uh, like New York, uh, to help people navigate their system. Uh, many, uh, many programs actually do focus on a particular area, like domestic violence, and look for translators, or someone just to be a companion for someone who is trying to file a, a request for a protective order while they go through that nerve-wracking process. Um, in, in other areas like representing children in custody matters, there's a national organization, CASA, where people can be trained to provide services. They don't have to be lawyers. Um, and actually, that's a very meaningful uh, role and experience. Similarly, in some communities, special education, you can be a non-lawyer and help a family uh, go through the system of applying for appropriate placement for a child. Um, I, I do think, though, that you've identified a wonderful need, and maybe your law school could uh, create a website where people who want to volunteer could be matched with different programs that are looking for volunteers. That's a good idea. We may, uh, we may do that. Um, One thing I would add is that uh, the idea of pro bono is so deeply uh, in, involved in the legal profession. I've been intrigued to find that people in other fields are, are attracted to it and don't have it. So computer programmers, for example, or people with a business background. Um, finding that actually pro bono services, giving their services for free, can be a very gratifying activity, whether it's to help uh, access to justice or other causes. Uh, and I think that's uh, also very, very promising, particularly as we have baby boomers retiring and saying, how can I be helpful and take my life's uh, work and experiences and share them? So various uh, reserved, uh, there are different names in different communities, but reserved service or retired service or second time around service, those kinds of programs are also, I think, very meaningful. Well, you know, it's interesting because the millennials, as much as they get a bad rap sometimes, one of the things that I think is one of the positive stereotypes, so to speak, with millennials is that they're very focused on meaning, right? And feeling like they're doing something socially valuable. And it is interesting because as a lawyer, I guess I don't think about it a lot that, you know, pro bono just seems like a given in our profession, yes. but we forget that that's not always the case. And if we could promote a, a greater attitude or environment of volunteerism generally, right, that would help on so many fronts, not the least, the people providing those services themselves. 
Absolutely. You know, when Alexis de Tocqueville toured the United States in the 1830s or 40s from France, one of the elements that struck him as so unusual was the volunteerism of America. And to this day, we actually have a wonderful tradition, civic uh, engagement, civic uh, community engagement. But I think for many people, they work very hard, you know, juggling family and work. Uh, finding a way to volunteer isn't always easy. And yet that probably is the way to strengthen so much of our lives. Well, uh, with that, on that positive note, we actually are out of time. Um, Martha, I want to thank you once again for taking time to, to talk with us. I, I was certainly illuminated, and I'm sure it was informative for our audience as well. For those of you watching, I hope you've enjoyed. Uh, the archive will be available soon. Uh, if you want to check back and reference some of the entities or websites that we talked about that might be able to provide services or might provide ways for you to get involved, um, so thank you again. I hope everyone enjoys and I hope we all take it to heart and do a little bit more, whatever we can do to try and, you know, help others, whether it's in a legal capacity or just as a citizen. Well, thank you, Marty. This has been really instructive and thanks for all you're doing. Thank you. Take care, everybody.